what can we do in terms of bringing more features over to the Lightning Network instead of relying on the web for as many things. It's actually kind of hard to run a web server. It's not easy. My argument is maybe all these steps are kind of like too complicated for our use cases. Like if you think about what Lightning is, it's just sending payments and it's we don't have all of these other requirements that the web kind of brings brings to bear. It made me think it's like, what if we just could do everything over Lightning and then Lightning is, and it is kind of like this internet, this alternate web where you can communicate between nodes and transact and fetch invoices and imagine you're trying to pay for something and the Tor network's getting DDoS and now you can't pay for something. It's like this, we shouldn't be building, you know, we're trying to build like the payment, you know, network of the future. And it, this is just, it just seems like it shouldn't be unreliable. Fiat Jaff is like, hey, we could just make this way simpler instead of relying on um, your identity being tied to these servers. We'll just, your identity is just a, a private key. Um, the simplest possible censorship resistant Twitter alternative that's like a global social network. I wouldn't be working on Nostra if I didn't think it was the answer. It's the simplest possible way to implement this thing that we want. William Casserone is a Bitcoin and Lightning developer working on a new project called Donus, which is built on the Nostra protocol. We had a technical discussion where William explained why he views the Lightning Network as the communications layer for the Bitcoin economy. We discussed the web and how it may evolve over time. And we also got into William's work on LN Link, on Noster, and on Damas. I've also added William to today's show splits. So if you enjoyed this show and if you learned something new, the best way you can support it is by sending in sats over the Lightning Network. I've also added one listener to today's show, Splits, who sent in a great question for William, which you will hear at the end of the show in the lightning round. If you would like to earn sats from this show, there's two ways you can do that now. The first way is to go download Fountain. They just launched a listen to earn feature where anyone can earn sats for simply listening to podcasts. Definitely check it out. It's getting quite a bit of attention in the Bitcoin ecosystem lately and it's worth downloading Fountain for. You can listen to this show on Fountain if you're not already. The second way you can earn sats is by sending me questions for future guests. Keep an eye out on my Twitter account. I'm gonna announce future guests a day before I film with them. And when you see my tweet come out announcing a new guest, you can send a boost over Fountain, send a message over the Lightning Network using Fountain, and you can ask a question to that guest. And I'm gonna have the guests pick their favorite question that came in from listeners, and that listener will get a portion of the show splits, um, just like the listener from today's episode is going to get as well. Before we get into today's episode, I just wanna give a quick shout out to our two sponsors for today. First is Voltage. Voltage is the industry standard and next generation provider for Lightning Network infrastructure. Today's show is also sponsored by Zebedee, your portal into the world of Bitcoin gaming. We'll have more from Voltage and Zebedee later in the show. William, thanks for joining me today. I'm really excited to get into a discussion that is a little bit outside of my comfort zone. It's, we're gonna talk about some technical topics today, um, all related to Lightning and Bitcoin, but I'm excited to get, to get your perspective on things. Before yeah. we get into that though, why don't we start off with your, your background in Bitcoin. How'd you get into Bitcoin? How'd, how'd you first learn about it? What made you decide to be become a developer building on Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I got into Bitcoin pretty early, around 2010. Uh, it, I think I saw it on like Hacker News or something. And it was just, uh, it seemed like a toy. It was kind of like this curious thing. I didn't really think much of it. I, I downloaded it and played with it. Uh, but that's what it kind of was at the time. It was just kind of like a toy. Um, and and that's how I was treated by the community. I think it was like a dollar or 30 cents or something at the time. Um, but yeah, and then I I've always it was always it was always in the background and I always like was playing with it here and there. Um, and then one day I decided to try to integrate it into the company I was working for at the time, which is uh, Monster Cat, which is a record label. So I think we were one of the first record labels in 2013 to sell uh, some of our albums with Bitcoin. So that was fun. Um, yeah. And then the price kept going up and started learning more and more about money. I'm like, this seems like it could become a big deal. So I eventually left Monster Cat and decided to work on a lightning startup. Um, called Sats Backer, which didn't really go that far because Lightning was just too too young. <laughs> I think I was like one of the first nodes on the network, and I was I was excited. I'm like we can we can build this out, but at the time, it was just no one really was using Lightning or or heck even still Bitcoin at the time. So yeah, then so I just I've just been working on Lightning ever since, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So 
What was the business sats backer? What were you trying to build then? And what do you think, looking back now, what kind of went wrong or wasn't quite ready for adoption? <laughs> yeah, it was this uh, this platform, this crowd. I think it was yeah, a crowdfunding platform like thing where you could subscribe and um, support uh, you know support people you are you know wanted to support with over Lightning. So the idea was that you would uh, have a subscription, you'd pay them Sats monthly and things like that. Um, I think the, there's a few things that why it didn't really take off. First of all, because like Lightning was just too young, right? And it's just no, it wasn't really ready for prime time yet. So that there was no no users. Maybe a couple of developers were on it, but um, so that was a big one. And the other issue was I realized it would have been helpful to have like recurring payments, which is, um, I think I might actually try to attempt it now. And now that we're getting bull 12 recurrences eventually, but even though that was, I think recently acts, but, um, once we have like recurrences and subscriptions on lightning, it, it would, it would make a lot more sense because the workflows were just too awkward. I think it would like send you an email link and say, Hey, pay this invoice like every month. And I don't know, there could, there could be better ways we could do it. Um, but yeah, I think the mainly it was just, we were, it was just way too early. Um, and we need to build out some, there was no wallets or anything like that, so. Yeah, it seems like, like right now, every Bitcoin payment is basically like a push payment, right? Like we don't have that yeah. sense of like a pull payment, like, and that's what so much of the, you know, fiat world today is built on, like all your subscriptions, your Netflix, your credit card stuff, Amazon, like it's all pull payments. So yeah. what what does that unlock for Bitcoin and, and how, you know more about the technical side of this than I do. What What is the roadmap to adopting that and, and getting that implemented across different Lightning implementations and widely available for the Bitcoin ecosystem? Yeah, I think we, we want to keep that property where it's a push payment system because there's nothing more annoying than trying to track down like your, some sub, some awkward subscription you, that you can't cancel and you can't contact like their their customer service department. So that is something I hope we, we can leave far behind far behind forever. Um, so the way that we envision it on Lightning um, is that your Lightning node just does push payments. It's very it's kind of it's kind of simple. It just does push payments at at, at a regular inter interval. Um, so the way I, I I picture it like in terms of integration in apps, you can you, you probably have your like Lightning wallet. And then you just see a list of your subscriptions that you can cancel at any time. Um, so, you know, this is, and it, so it's all your subscriptions are one spot and you can manage them and you can cancel them. So like, that's how it should be. Um, and so there was an initial spec designed by Rusty in, in, in Bolt 12, which I think he's cutting back. So I don't know if it's gonna get in there, uh, but that would be really nice to have. And hopefully we'll see that on Lightning sometime in the future. What's the status of Bolt 12? Because this has been something that I've I've seen a lot of discussion about it on Twitter over the last six months. I've I've heard a lot of things about it, but I I, I don't quite have a, a technical understanding of how it works and what are the roadblocks to adoption. Would love to hear more on that topic. Yeah, so Bolt Twelve was an attempt or is an attempt to um, basically bring a lot of the functionality that was lacking. So so there's a, a spec that uh, Fiat Jaff put together called Elinural, which is very popular on the web. And it kind of was designed to cover a lot of the pain points with just um, with interacting with Lightning. So being able to fetch, create invoices on the fly, things like that, and doing that over the web, um, that's what that Elinural spec enabled. Um, but you know, as Lightning developers are like, well, we should be able to do some of these, some of the same same things on Lightning itself um, without having to re like if we have to rely on the web for like basic functionality within the Lightning network. Um, there's some issues with that. Um, because the the web has a different security model, and, you know, you it kind of relies to, to, you you kind of have to have trust in um, certificate authorities to not ban in the middle of you and things like that. So we want to avoid a lot of um, like depending on the web for like core functionality, right? So you sh so Bolt twelve is an attempt to bring some of the Elinural features into into the Lightning Network itself. Um, so yeah, so one example is just being able to um, fetch an invoice over the Lightning Network. Um, so. Bolt 12 enables some of the some of these things, which is uh, which can be really useful. So imagine if you print out a Bolt 12, which is just a uh, yeah, it's just like a QR code like any other, and then you can scan it with your app, and then you can get an invoice, you can fetch an invoice, and then you can pay that invoice, and you can do that all without ever touching the web, which is has some benefits. Right, and then what does that roadmap look like to get? Is Bolt 12 now available for all implementations? What how does that work? I think there's. Um, so the initial version was very ambitious because you know uh, we wanted to bring as many features over that 
you know, Ellen Ural was doing it at the time. We wanted to have all those features um, and more and have it more secure and all these things. So what, what ended up happening was just, it was the spec that just was this huge kitchen sink of things that we would love and which will make it better, which will make both, which will be better for the Lightning Network for payments. It's just that it was a lot for implement implementers to, you know, not everyone has, you know, a Rusty on their team who can do all this stuff in like a weekend. Um, so, and, and other teams have different priorities. I think like Lightning Labs was working on Taro at the time. And and, and I think Lalu focused a lot on the, uh, was working on the new Music 2 encryption um, and like other parts of the spec. So yeah, it's just, it's there. And I, th I think the spec is currently still being kind of revised and there's still feedback happening, but um, yeah, there is a lot to implement. So we're just trying to cut it back and figure out what's the best way to implement, uh, you know, release it incremental, incrementally, so. Right. Now, okay, let's let's talk about the web and the Lightning Network because yeah. this is a good this is a good jumping off point here. You have a you recently uh, published a presentation. Uh, it's titled "The Lightning Network: More Than Just Payments." Mm -hmm. um, and in the in, in the early stages here, you you explain that the Lightning Network does not build on the web, and I think this may be a first touch point that I want to. I want to hammer home here. I want to get you to elaborate on the differences between building on the web and building on Lightning Network. Yeah, so the web, when people say the web, what they really mean is a suite of protocols such as, you know, HTTP, HTTPS, um, so, and TLS, and, you know, there's a, and there's a lot of web protocols. There's like HTTP2, HTTP3, there's like Quick. Um, there's, a, there's a huge, like, suite of protocols that our, that our browsers implement to, like, that makes, that makes the web work. Um, so, but there, there can be other protocols built on the internet. So there's email, which is its own protocol there. Um, there's like these, um, yeah, bunch of other protocols. So the Lightning Network is another distinct protocol, an internet protocol that's distinct from the web. Um, and it has, in, it's in some sense more secure than the web because it, it uses this technology, this, this protocol called the noise protocol, um, which is an, a very, very secure encryption protocol that um, technology such as WireGuard, so you might have, People might have heard WireGuard, which is like a really secure VPN that's built into the Linux kernel. Um, so, so all of these technologies, they use this um, very good encryption, um, which doesn't rely on certificate authorities and you know, and all the and all the headaches of the web. So, yeah, it, it's in some sense there. It's like a they're two different internet protocols, and you know we don't necessarily need to depend on the web for a lot of functionality. So, um, I think a lot of the stuff I've been working on recently is like, how, what can we? do in terms of bringing more features over to the Lightning Network instead of relying on the web for as many things. Oh. Mm. So there's there's like these two kind of schools of thought. Um, yeah. You kind of touched on it with LNURL. I've heard people f take that approach and say, you know, let's let's try and integrate the Lightning Network into the web. Let's use URLs. Let's use, let's use some of the tools that we already have available. And then here there's another school of thought now that is let's build let's build a new kind of like a lightning web for lack of a better term right yeah um what what is the so can you make the case for both those can you kind of give us like <clears throat> a background of like why you might want to build a brand new lightning web given that we have you know we, we've got what 30 plus years of like development and and adoption in this current web that everyone knows yeah. What's what's the case for why you should build a new one? Yeah, so maybe we'll start with uh, you know why we might just want to not build a lightning web and just use the web. Um, yeah, so sure. the web the web is here and it's really built out and all our you know we have apps for you know the, the web. That's how we interact with you know stores online, and you know it's here and it's useful and, and you can use that and, and that's you know that's a pretty powerful argument. It's just it's here and it works right. Um, yeah. So yeah, so you could totally do that. Um, so one thing that I think about is how many people actually run a web server in their house and to like, and serve customers through their house, like, you know, as a, usually, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, it's actually kind of hard to run a web server. It's not easy. You have to like go and buy a certificate from this, um, and buy a domain and all these like complicated steps. Um, and my argument is maybe all these steps are kind of like too complicated for our use cases. Like if you think about what lightning is, it's just sending payments and it's, we don't have all of these other requirements that the web kind of brings, brings to bear on, on a particular problem. So when you actually just strip out, if you, if you, if you just take the standpoint of like, let's not focus necessarily on, let's, let's see what we can do in just the lightning network. You can actually simplify a lot of um, 
applications. Um, so it may even get start to get into that in terms of like what you can do just using the lightning network, lightning network by itself and like how that simplifies things. Um, that's something we can get into, and that's kind of what that talk I, I gave recently was about. So um, yeah. I want to hear more about the complexity of running a web server, though. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is all new to me. Like, wh what if I'm Facebook and I'm running a server um, and I've got all this customer data? Like, wh what's the what's the process? What do I have? <clears throat> what's the overhead? What's the technical like debt I have to accrue to to make that work? Yeah, I mean, you have to be pretty technical to run a web server at scale. So you need to, um, even if you're not doing it at scale, maybe you just want to run it for your business, maybe you would uh, buy a, a VPS, which is a virtual private server. You buy it from like a company like Linode or, or Amazon, you know, AWS. And then you have to buy a domain. So like bobsburgers.com or something. And then you have to buy a certificate. Um, nowadays, those are free. You can use a Let's Encrypt, but um, it's still complicated to run like a Let's Encrypt, Let's Encrypt script to like get a certificate, which is like what gives you that green lock in your browser. So once you've done all those things, um, now you can you can oh not oh now you need to run a proxy server for your for your web server so that you know maybe you have multiple applications so you want to have different uh, it's just it's just very it's just a lot right where bitcoiners yeah. don't really understand like if you're not a non technical bitcoiner and you just and they think it's like hard to run a bitcoin node bitcoin nodes are like the easiest thing to run <laughs> compared to <laughs> pretty much everything else like you have to be extremely technical to like set up a web server and get it working that's why most people just outsource all of that to a company because they don't want to deal with that complexity. And so, right. the, but it's harder to do that in the lightning space. Cause the minute you start outsourcing things, they have control over your keys, especially when you're in the lightning context. So my argument is like, if we're relying on the web and considering how hard it is to set up a web server on the web and to maintain all that in databases and stuff, um, it's going to move a lot of people into custodial solutions. And, and that is scary to me because I, I don't, that, that would be just really depressing if we just have a custodial lightning nodes everywhere. And that's how, most of the um, economy is run, the Bitcoin economy. So I was saying, how can we make it simple so you can just run a Bitcoin node and a Lightning node on a Raspberry Pi or probably probably something slightly better than Raspberry Pi, hopefully, if you're running it on your business. But, you know, a small computer, you can just buy a small computer, plug it in and have apps to just work with it directly um, so, people, and so people can, like, list products from your store or, like, you know, use their phone to pay for things just directly on the Lightning Network without having to deal with the complexity of the web. And that's why it's more interesting to me, specifically because of these new requirements where it makes more sense to run these nodes um, on premise, on, on your own, in your own, on your own hardware and in your own home and on your own, in your own business. We need to make it easier for people to like use apps in that environment because um, we can't rely on the web and, and the complexities that are involved with that. And, so. so that's naturally, if you're forcing people to then use their own devices, this is naturally going to be like a decentralizing force, right? Yeah, is, yeah. Can you talk about the, the centralizing forces that are on the web today? Like when you talked about buying certificates, yeah. who are you buying the certificates from? Yeah. What, who are the entities that are like in the middle of me and the merchant that I'm trying to make a transaction with? It's, 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 there's so many, right? So there. You know, at, at every level, they, um, you know, the domain name system and, you know, you can only have certain um, top level domains. Like there's only like dot, dot com, dot net. Some company and some organization determines all that for it. And, and you can't have like dot Bitcoin. Right. So that's that's one example. So the certificate authorities, typically the way that it works, it works in like a tree like structure. You have a root authority, which has the root, um, which gives um, the authority for so other intermediate um, certificate authorities will then use the root signature and then that those interne intermediate certificate authorities will then give you your certificate and there's like a there's a signature chain so at every level there's points where people who you don't know and you don't might not even trust can actually forge um, a certificate which is a way and a certificate certificate is just a way of um, verifying that a domain name like bobsburgers.com um, um, that it matches a particular um, yeah so there's a lot of I don't know there's a lot of issues with like because the web it, it was built in a different context of and it wasn't really built with the security in mind the, with, where the, whereas the Lightning Network you just have a pub key associated with um, with your node and then you can use that to create a shared secret and it's like gets rid of all that complexity in some sense so mm -hmm. it's curious to me like I, I pick I, I imagine where I want to go up to a shop and just scan their QR code and now I have a direct direct relationship with that company and I can start interacting with them I can start buying their products 
and without even relying on anything on the web. And I, I find that might be an interesting use case, which is, uh, yeah, what I've been looking into recently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, the, in this slide deck, you, um, you talked about how Lightning offers this, like, ultra-secure way of sending info between two different computers. Yeah. Um, what are some of the interesting apps that could be uh, enabled by <clears throat> Lightning? You know, like what? What, yeah. are you, what is Lightning uniquely suited for? Um, it's it's interesting because in theory you could use it for anything because um, the way just because of the way it was designed. So at the very lowest levels, it has it's the noise protocol, so it's super secure. Um, basically, the same protocol that you know advanced VPNs use. So that at the very base level, you have that. But on on top of that, there's there's a packet structure. It's a way of sending information between two Lightning nodes. Um, so it's called TLV. You might have heard it. Um, in other contexts, but it just means type length value. So you have a type, which is this is this is what this packet's about, and then you have the length, which is the size of the packet, and then the value could be anything. It's just arbitrary data. Um, so in one use case that I uh, that I put together is if you go to like my website jb55.com, that website does not talk to a web server to fetch invoices. Doesn't have an LNURL, LNURL server. There's a bit of uh, WebSocket code that just connects directly to my C Lightning node and and fetches um, invoices. So it basically, you, I, so this is funny because I, I originally was trying to build like this crowdfunding platform with my original startup. And I, re, and I realized there was so much complexity in that. Like I needed, it, it was like, it was custodial and it's like, I didn't want to, it was just really, I don't know. But in some sense, I've evolved from that, um, like a business oriented idea of like a startup idea to, you could actually build a, a crowdfunding platform directly by just talking to your node. Um, which is, I think, is, is pretty crazy that it, you could it, that you it, that it simplifies it that much, right? Um, so that right. is just one, so that's one example of just creating your own crowd, crowdfunding platform that just literally just talks to your node and then tallies the the payments to your to I don't know. So um, so that's one yeah. example. And so there's no there's no one in the, in intermediating that you know process, right? Like your yeah. website, someone shows up. Yeah. and gets an invoice directly from your node yeah. and no one else participates in that yeah and then it, transaction. and i and i call another method that just it just says list all of the payments to this particular um, um invoice that has this description in it so it can show all the people who donated and that's just actually getting it right out of my node um so it, it, right now it requires a little bit of work it requires some a, a feature called plugins in the core lightning um ecosystem but i get i can imagine one day in the future where um, all Lightning nodes just have a standard set of uh, things you can call, and like listing products or you know generating invoices, and then your your uh, your app can just talk to the nodes directly. Um, so that's kind of the the goal. Mm -hmm. Now you you finish this uh, slide deck by talking about how Lightning could become the communications layer for the Bitcoin economy, and I think when a lot of people think of Lightning, they think payments. And they don't think communications. Can you talk to me about like what the the differences between those two are, and what what people are getting kind of lost in translation about? I think the way you phrase it is probably better. It's like it's the it's like the Bitcoin internet. Because um, uh, if you if you think about if you look at how Bitcoin Core was designed, it's it's not meant to be accessed from a network, and that's for a really good reason, right? You don't want people to you know be able to get into your node and send money around. Um, so I think uh, Lightning provides this way of kind of connecting Bitcoin nodes to each other because um, that's in some sense what the Lightning Network is. It's a way of sending messages to computers that have Lightning nodes and Bitcoin nodes on them. So it's, it's, it made me think, it's like, what if we just could do everything over Lightning and then Lightning is, and it is kind of like this internet, this alternate web where you can communicate between nodes and transact and fetch invoices. And um, there's, there's a really cool protocol that uh, Lisa... Ha, ha, uh, that built using the same idea. So she ha, she built this idea of like a liquidity ad system, and it yes. and it runs on the Lightning Network, and that's just using TLVs, and um, so you can send out your you can advertise channel liquidity over the Lightning Network. So that's like one example of an app on the Lightning that's that's just sending packets between nodes. Um, so that that's like an, a first step toward like this Lightning Internet in some sense. And so that is just essentially Bitcoin nodes connecting to each other and advertising their own you know liquidity preferences and things like that yeah over the lightning network using those using those tlvs with a, a custom like type 
Um, so it might say like, oh, liquidity add and send it out. I'm not, <laughs> I haven't looked at the spec directly because so I don't know exactly how it works, but it's, uh, it does use the Lightning Network. So, so my app, so for instance, Ellen Link, um, since it just, it looks like a Lightning node when I connect to my, to my Lightning node, <laughs> In some sense, it's just a, a really dumb lightning node because it can't really do anything. I just set the feature bits to zero. But I, I can actually start receiving gossip from the network, and I can also start receiving liquidity ads from the network. So the minute I connect to my node at home, I can actually start seeing liquidity ads into my app if I implemented that. Um, so this is like a benefit of, you know, when, when things are getting gossiped around the network, you can actually, like, uh, apps can pick up on that and do interesting things with it. So. Now, if you strip out the Lightning Network and we just talk about like Bitcoin nodes connecting to each other to mm -hmm. you know maintain state on the network, how is that different from what you're doing on Lightning? I want to understand the difference between like the Bitcoin nodes and their relationship yeah. to each other managing state versus yeah, Lightning. So you're are you referring to like the Bitcoin Core peer-to-peer uh, -peer network in some sense? Yeah, yeah. So I th so Bitcoin, it's. Uh, it's, it's in some sense like it's a gossip network. It's you're sending whenever it sees a transaction, you're gossiping it to all your your peers, and the goal with the the Bitcoin peer to peer network is to get transactions to every single Bitcoin node, right? So if if you send out a Bitcoin uh, transaction, you're trying to gossip it to every single node in the world, um, which you might not necessarily necessarily want to do on Lightning. Um, so in my particular use cases, I just want to talk to my node directly to send a payment to like I. I just I'm instructing my node to, to do a payment. So that's one use, that's one case where I just want to connect directly to a specific node and say something to it specifically authenticated with a authentication key. Um, and um, as far as I know, again, I'm not too familiar with the Bitcoin peer to peer network. I think there is a some level of encryption. I don't think it always had encryption, but um, Lightning is just a ve again, very secure network for doing peer to peer encrypted communications. And there's even a spec of uh, being able to do onion messages, which is controversial where you can send arbitrary data through like kind of like a Tor like system over the Lightning Network, which might be interesting. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, the Bitcoin peer to peer network was not really designed to be a generic uh, communications protocol. It was just meant for very specific things like broadcasting transactions, but the Lightning Network is much more flexible and much more extendable, which makes uh, these mm. use cases really interesting. I see. So if you were to put on your prediction hat right now and, and we look out you know, to the year 2030, what are the implications of uh, having the Lightning Network as the communications layer for the Bitcoin economy? What is that? What 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 doors open up when that is a reality? Uh, the reason why I hope that's the future is that um, one thing that it opens up is so if you're looking at you know how the economies are distributed, you know it's typically I mean the way that I picture it is like a power law distribution where maybe you have some big players. And they would be running, you know, web nodes because it's like high scale and things like that. But like the tail, the long tail of the economy are these small businesses who just want to be able to, you know, assuming a world where people are using Bitcoin and transacting. And um, we need to make it easy for that long tail to, you know, just spin up a Bitcoin node, spin up a Lightning node without relying on these huge centralized entities to, to handle all that for them. Right. So um, I think without doing it on Lightning and just I think we're, it's inevitably going to move to like centralized solutions for a lot of these things where maybe if if we were using the lightning network it would just be easier for these companies and these businesses to um because all they'd have to do is just plug in a bitcoin computer and now customers can interact with them and that should be what we're going what we should that it shouldn't be more complicated than that because otherwise they just won't do it right um mm -hmm. so, yeah what are the what are the implications of centralized solutions winning out like, what's the what's the worst case scenario if you think about the this divergence between you know a future where everything is decentralized and a future where yeah we kind of have we have centralized wallets we have you know people that have to rely on Square or some other you know corporation for for access. Um, what do you think? What, what's the biggest issue there with, with centralization? Ultimately, ultimately, these large um, companies that are managing money for like the entire country. Um, they're subject to, you know, the local regulations, local laws. And, you know, if they're, if you're, if your business is transacting and for some reason they, they don't like it, they can just like prevent you from transferring, especially if they're holding the keys. So maybe, maybe the a slightly better situation is if there was, they had some type of non-custodial setup and they're just managing like just the infrastructure then like, that's fine. Like that's not too bad. But the worst case scenario is if, you know, they're controlling the keys, they're controlling the nodes, then, then you're just back to, you're just PayPal. 
you know, right. they could just <laughs> they can stop you from withdrawing your money and it's just like okay well what did we really accomplish now we have this really slow database and <laughs> it's like really complicated net lightning network that just it just overcomplicates things just so we can go back to square one, right? So we're trying to avoid that outcome. So, <laughs> so mostly due to the the key ownership. If if it's like the infrastructure and that has to be centralized, that that may not be the worst problem in the world, but but it it's the key that is absolutely like a must have. Yeah, and then you have some other. Even if you're um, non custodial at the key level, you know, not running your own own nodes leaks in some sense leaks your privacy because. They might have infrastructure that's man, man, you know, man, showing you your balances, so they know your keys. They know they can see your transaction history. So there are benefits to um, having like a, even if it's non-custodial, the, the services they're providing, it's they st it is still leaking privacy. Um, so we still want to make sure that this economy that we're building has very strong privacy characteristics, um, um, even if it's you could do the same thing with a non-custodial solution. So, right. How does your how does your vision for a lightning web connect or relate to the vision that people put out about Web three? There are mm -hmm. maybe multiple visions there, um, and then and and Web five as well. Yeah. With uh, with what the block team's working on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's so hard with these things. It's like the Web three, Web five. It's like they have these they have specific <laughs> visions for a decentralized web. So if you want to go into their the future with them, you have to like get locked in with their really complicated. Especially with Web five, it's like uh, there's like all this stuff that's already built on the web. It's not even really sp focused on Lightning or anything. I mean, they may say that we want to be more Bitcoin integrated, but it's still on the web and it's building on the web and it's really complicated. It use and some parts of it use IPFS and it's like I don't really understand. I don't know. So when when I think of like these decent, decentralizing the web, I, t to me what it what it should mean is that we should be looking at these like how do we create these um, open protocols that are you know stand on their own and how do we bridge them in interesting ways, um, and and how do we move away from platforms, right? So maybe this with these web five solutions will help with that, but um, I, I I fear that they're just in some sense too complicated for, and they don't really solve anything of that that interesting um and especially with web3 it's just like a lot of them are just tied to like shitcoin so um, yeah so at least web5 doesn't have that shitcoin attachment but it's still it seems like i don't know if that's right the right approach but who knows we'll see <laughs> yeah um my limited understanding of web5 is that there's basically no connection to any blockchain or any system other than like i think ion is is plugged into bitcoin at some level um, but there's basically no other, you know, token or there's no, um, you're not using it necessarily a lightning node. Um, why, why is it, why should we be using a lightning node and not generating, you know, a key for a decentralized identifier off of lightning? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's a good question. Like, why should we be doing, why should we, why should we be using decentralized identifiers for things? So they have um a lot of interesting like key rotation mechanisms um which might be interesting uh but again it just i'm not sure if it it's all that interesting i don't, <laughs> I don't know or if it solves many problems that are interesting that's my main concern with it is that yeah it says oh look we can do all these things but it's like okay but okay great you can rotate keys but i don't know I, maybe i'm just like Ooh. ignorant and don't know enough about it but when i looked into web5 there's it seemed like a very complicated spec and it was built on IPFS, which I already don't like. So I just I got, kind of got like a uh, same uck feeling, not as bad as the Web3 uck feeling, but similar. <laughs> what do you not like about IPFS? It's just very, very complicated. I don't know. I mean, maybe my bias is I just like, I like simple solutions to problems. So, and, you know, with Lightning, I know, you know, it, it works and I know how to like add some additional features onto it that's not too complicated. And I like that, where I can just easily jump into the protocol and make a small change to it and then do something really useful. So I was able to, like, in, in, in the Ellen Link case, I was able to just send a few RPCs over Lightning, and now I have this really powerful way to connect to my node from anywhere, um, which I, we didn't really talk about, like, why like why I originally <laughs> created this app, Ellen Link. Um, yeah, let's get into Ellen Link. Tell yeah. me more about why you started it. So I created it because I was just frustrated with the ways that um, the ways that you would connect to your node in the sense of if you if you're if you are running. So it is somewhat advanced to like run your own node. And um, but and it 
if you want to use your node to pay for something, it's kind of hard right now. So you have to, you know, there's there's some um, distributions like the Umbral node which make it easier, but usually what they do is they, they'll open up a Tor connection so you can access it remotely. And um, it requires all these web servers and like, and these web servers talk to your C Lightning node and it's just really complicated I found. And sometimes like the Tor network is not reliable. So imagine if you're trying to pay for something and the Tor network is getting DDoS and now you can't pay for something. It's like this, we shouldn't be building, you know, we're trying to build like the payment, you know, network of the future. And it, this is just, it just seems like it shouldn't be unreliable. So I'm like, I, I set out to like, how can we make this more extremely reliable? Um, so I'm like, hey, why don't we just do, um, why can't you just control your node over Lightning itself? Because your Lightning node is already on the network. It's already exposed to the public internet because you have for routing and things like that. So why not just like, hey, just send, just tell your node directly to pay for this thing. Um, so this is why I created the app because I just wanted a super reliable way that would work to, to pay for things um, without having to set up like VPNs or Tor or anything like that, so. Right, and so this this is a iOS app anyone can use to you know pay a merchant walking down the street and they want to pay someone you know, ten bucks, it can just pull directly from your node. Yeah, you just tell um, your, it just tells your node to like pay this thing, and then yeah, it doesn't it doesn't go through the web, doesn't go through Tor, doesn't go through your VPN, which might be blocked on a certain network. It just IP communications with over the noise protocol over Lightning, and it's just like it's fast, low latency, just works, and that's how it should be. It shouldn't be more complicated than that, right? Right. Now, one thing that I've seen, you know, we talked about Umbral and and the ways that they, you know, the ways you access your node through Umbral. They've got a, a growing app store now mm -hmm. of all sorts of different things you can do with your node. And it's, yeah. it's, some of it's related to Bitcoin, but some of it's not, right? Some of it's just like file storage or uh, passwords and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you see a future where is, is LM Link headed in that same direction? Do you, do you build out like an ecosystem of, of apps that people can use and access their node directly with? Yeah, so this is where it gets really interesting because I actually very strong as a software person as like who's like afraid of dependencies and things like that because they could have security vulnerable like a hacker can easily attack the supply chain and if you have a lot of uh, different libraries different pieces of software you're using that you're running on your computer then it's like a million opportunities for your node to be compromised and have your funds stolen. So I am actually don't like that model where they try to add so many things to your nodes it's like oh look at all these with these block explorers and all this stuff because it adds more and more software and that the more you it's like it's like this dragon that you're pulling in more and more dependencies that could have like this bad actor in it and that scares the hell out of me so um i'm trying to think of ways to like how can we get that level of functionality that the umbral, umbral nodes provide without having to install any software so it sounds like that sounds paradoxical but if you think about it a lot of the time, a lot, a lot of these apps, all they really do is are talking to that to your Lightning you know, Node direct, like uh, locally, to, to provide some extra functionality. So I'm saying, like, hey, what, like, let's, how how far can we get by just just having your Bitcoin node, just having your Lightning you node, and having all the apps exist as client apps that talk to RPCs over the Lightning network? Um, so the next experiment, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to doing this. I'm gonna try to build an entire e-commerce platform just as a uh, as, as a client app that just talks to my lightning node and I, I don't see why i couldn't do that just based off the rpcs that c lightning provides um i think this is a much more interesting future instead of like loading lo more and more security security liabilities onto your node at home like let's let's offload all of that logic into client applications that just talk to the lightning network and then you, you, then securing your node is like trivial because it's just like i i'm going to give I'm going to give this app access to like only fetch invoices, or I'm going to give this app access to only list invoices or list, list offers for product listings. Right. And then that's a much more secure way. And you're not running any other software, which is super, um, which is super nice for security. So there's no one's really doing this right now, but I think that's the approach, especially considering, um, what can happen if you have, if you're running too much garbage on your nodes. <laughs> so this e-commerce platform will then be accessible to anyone running a lightning node. Is that the idea? Yeah, so if um, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna investigate this to see like, are we lacking any RPCs that could enable this? Maybe you want some generic data storage API in in your Lightning node, but um, yeah, the idea is that you could just download this app and then you have this huge this entire platform that you know manages products that shows your invoices, your paid invoices, every because that's what Lightning nodes already kind of do, right? They they create invoices and people pay those invoices and and you and, and now in Core Lightning you can create these offers which are kind of like products so you could totally build this interface on top of your node that just builds this e-commerce platform and in the way that people interact with that maybe um 
again, another client application that just lists offers and then they can pay those, they can buy things directly from your node. So I don't know, I, I, that's, it, I think it's a really interesting approach and I wanna see if, that, if, if, if I can pull it off, but uh, I think it'll be really powerful. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I just wanna give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Voltage. Voltage is the industry standard for Lightning Network infrastructure. Creating layer two applications and services on top of Bitcoin starts with Voltage, where you can spin up nodes, get access to liquidity, optimize your node, and much more. Voltage is leading the way as the next generation provider of Lightning Network infrastructure. And if you wanna get a free trial and start using Voltage today, you can do so at voltage.cloud. Um, one thing you mentioned a lot is like you're building on, on Core Lightning right now. Um, why, on, why are you building on Core Lightning? Why not LND? What do you think of the other implementations today? I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, so as, a, as like, the, I'm, so I'm a C nerd. I, I love the C programming language because um, just for simplicity and it's very like lightweight. It's, resource, it's not resource intensive at all. And, and that's kind of what I want on my software, like on my nodes that I'm running. So I don't want to have, uh, I want to keep it very, very simple, very small, so you can run on a Raspberry Pi, right? So that's, again, that's one motivation. Um, mainly, I just really like C, and I like coding in C, so. Uh, but it just turns out that C Core Lightning has this really powerful plugin feature, so you can create new handlers for custom messages on the Lightning Network. So it just makes it trivial. So for example, one thing I did, um, so Rusty has this uh, plugin called Commando, which, exp and this is what powers a lot of the things, a lot of the things I've been talking about. It just exposes Core Lightning's RPC, so remote procedure calls. Basically, their list of methods that you can do things on your node, like pay, uh, fetch invoice. So it expo exposes all of those um, RPC methods over the Lightning network, over uh, commando um, TLVs. So that's how, it's like all of a sudden you can just control your node and everything that a Lightning node can do, you can now do it because of this one plugin that just e exposes that. Um, so that's really powerful because now if you wanna, the plugin system also allows you to add more RPCs to extend Core Lightning with new RPCs. And now all of a sudden, those RPCs are now available over Lightning due to the Commando plugin. Um, so it's like this, well, like, it's so much power. I'm like, oh my God. So another thing I did was I exposed all of my Core Light or my um, Bitcoin Core nodes RPCs over Lightning. So I, one demo I built was I built a, a GUI for my Bitcoin Core node in my browser. Just over, and it just, it just talks directly to my, um, my, my Lightning node, which then my lightning node talks to my core node and uh, I can now list transactions from my core node. Um, and it's, and I, I feel comfortable doing this because it has a really good authentication system and a really good, and, and, and like the most secure encryption you could ever have, which is the noise protocol. Right. So I'm like, Holy crap. <laughs> like this is a lot of power. I just like installed a few plugins and now I can access my Bitcoin core node remotely, um, without having to worry about certificates or the web. So I'm like, uh, this started to get my mind going, like what else can I do? <laughs> so I want to try this e-commerce platform next. Right. And so this, this kind of plug-in functionality is not available now on other implementations? No. So the way that you write an app on LND is that you talk to, I think, through their gRPC interface. So you have to like, you have to, you have to write a piece of, you have to write a server code, like a piece of standalone server code that talks to, to that node over RPC. And it's from what I could tell, I, cause I was trying to implement um, Commando in LND, which is a way to expose the RPC. Cause I, I wanted LNLink to be able to talk to LND nodes as well. I just felt it was just really difficult and I never got around to it, but with core lightning, it was just so trivial to extend. Um, so I think that's the main reason I use it. It's just, it's very lightweight, efficient, has the plugin system, which is amazing for, de for developing. If you're making the, you know, lightning apps over the light network, so. Yeah. Do you think it's an issue um, when, when we talk about like the adoption of some of these apps, like your, your e-commerce platform, if, uh, if that takes off, uh, a crowdfunding platform, things like that. Is is it an issue if, um, you know, only a portion of the Lightning Network can access it? If, you know, only on one implementation, a certain feature is supported? How, I guess, what are the implications here? Does this, if, if features, if uh, implementations do not kind of collaborate and work together and, and implement some of the same features, are, are we at risk of really slowing down progress on Lightning? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a huge issue, and that's why um, I started exploring some of these things early because I, I don't imagine it using Commando. Like, if if I don't think all implementations are going to implement Commando and, and implement C Lightning's RPCs, um, but you know, it would be ideal if we had a standard set of RPCs that are just like 
very well specified blip um, TLVs that you can use for RPC that works for any node. That is something that would be really attractive. Um, it, you know, Rusty doesn't seem like that's going to be likely just because um, each node has different ways of doing things. Um, but I still think we could distill down to a, a you know a small set of useful print of TLVs that we can use that would be cross compatible. Like like paying for things shouldn't be that hard. It's just it's just pay, and then you give it an invoice and you have some type of authentication token that hopefully we can all agree on. Um, and then all of a sudden, Ellen Link would just work for all the Lightning nodes. And I really wish we can get there. We're just it's it's a bit early, right? This is a new idea, but that would be the ideal okay. scenario. Is that we want to standardize these things? Same with like liquidity. Yeah, it's like I think Core Lightning is. I've, the only I'm not sure if it's the only node that implements it, but it's just an example. It's like these messages are getting sent over the Lightning Network, so if LND doesn't implement it, then they won't have that functionality, right? So, yeah, I, th I think you're right about that. I think it's just Core Lightning right now. Um, so it's a, yeah, so it's a it's a it's an issue in, in terms of anything, right? Because people only have so much time, and if it, if there's enough interest and and, it, and it's useful enough, then hopefully all the there'd be enough pressure from the users of those nodes to like implement it. Yeah. I got you. Um, okay, let's talk about Nostra or yeah. Nostr or however you pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. N O S T R for those who are unfamiliar. Um, can you explain maybe at a high level what is Nostra? Yeah, so Nost I call it Nostra because I have an app Nostra. called Damas. Right. So Nostra Damas. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so but some people call it Nostra. Um, yeah, so Nos Nostra was an attempt. It was written by uh, this guy named Fiat Jaff. He also obviously involved in the LN Ural spec. Um, so a lot of Bitcoiners just happen to be in the space just because, you know, Fiat Jaff made it. Um, but it's not a Bitcoin project. It's not a Lightning project. It's this distinct protocol. And it was designed, it was Fiat Jaff's attempt at making um, the simplest possible censorship resistant Twitter alternative that's like a global social network. Um, so there has been, there, there was attempts at, at this in the past. So one was called Mastodon, which uses the activity pro protocol. Um, and there's been other imp activity pub implementations, uh, but that one, and I used it for a while. I used it for a couple of years. It's like, um, but it had a very big issue, which was when you join these, uh, you had to join like a server and this server, you know, was your community, right? So you would join a server and then, oh, look, we have this decentralized, and this server could talk to other servers and it was this federated model where you could send messages between servers. And it's like, this is great. We're decentralizing Twitter. Like, um, but it had a really bad issue where <laughs> it just turned, each of these communities turned into like dictatorships and they all hated each other. And if you said one wrong thing, the server admin would just ban you off the server and then you'd have to like go through this awkward process of like, uh, moving all your followers to a new instance, and hopefully you wouldn't get you wouldn't anger that admin, and he would ban you. It just it turned out to be like less censorship resistant than Twitter, which is like wow, we really failed on this one, guys. If it's um, so, I think ultimately that model failed. This this idea of a federated server model just for a censorship resistant global social network just didn't pl didn't play out. So Fiat Jaff was like, hey, we could just make this way simpler instead of relying on um, your identity being tied to these servers will just your t identity is just a, a private key. It's actually the same type of key that's used in um, Taproot, which is like these um, Schnorr keys. Um, sec 256. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so now you just have a key that's associated to your identity and then you can just publish me publish messages, which are just JSON blobs and signed with your your key. And then you can just send that to like maybe five or six or 10 relays or a hundred relays and that message and these relays are dumb. So they just accept messages of any kind signed by different people. And then you're not at risk of being banned from any individual server. Cause if, if one relay bans you, it doesn't matter because your messages are on six other relays and you can keep moving. And it's really easy to transfer your messages, but just by copying from one relay to another. So it's a really simple idea of just building this censorship resistant decentralized database in some sense. It's not even necessarily Twitter specific. That's just one use case. But people, I think one person built a chess engine on top of Nostra. Um, it's like a, anyway, so it's a lot of different use cases are built for like a uh, and, it, and I think the most important property is that it's not a blockchain. It's like this, this obsession of putting everything to blockchain is just ridiculous. So like we have a really efficient databases like Postgres and SQLite. Like why would, why does everything have to be into a, be in an immutable ledger? It just, it's just, it's just silly. So uh, luckily, it doesn't have that infliction. Yeah. So this is an open database, though. And is it is it different from like databases you'd find on the web? <laughs> yeah. So databases you'd find on the web, typically you download a piece of software and you control the database, and and that's still true here, um, but usually they're very locked down. Like you can't. You, typically, web apps don't 
interact with databases directly because you can just like run a command that says delete all records and now you can hose anyone's database. So you need some type of interface to that database. So Nostra defines this very simple way of querying um, the database. And so you can say like, hey, give me all the posts from this user's pub key. Um, and then it'll stream it to you in real time. So it has this WebSocket component, which allows you to um, create chat rooms and things like that. So I can say, hey, subscribe to this chat room, and then it'll get all the messages of that chat room in, in real time. So it's like this real-time database that has a, a well-defined interface for que querying and, and putting data into the database. Um, so where's the data living? Is it, is it in the, like if I am running, uh, if I'm running Nostr, and I have a, it, I, can I just run it on my phone on through, through Domus, the uh, the client you built. Yeah. So the so yeah. So Domus is a client that talks this protocol that knows how to talk to these databases. These they're called relays. And um, so the databases are the relays. Databases are the relays. So you don't have to run. You don't have to run a node, right? This is a, another very important pr principle within Nostra is that to get in to get to get onboarded, you don't have to run anything. You just um, you just say, hey, I'm going to send all my messages to these ten relays, and new relays are popping up all the time. Um, so uh, okay. it's very simple. Like if you actually download the, if you go to domus.io and there's a link at the bottom, you can join the test flight. Um, and then to create an account, you don't even have to put your email address. You don't have to put in your phone number. You don't have to put anything. You just put, you can set any username you want and then it'll give you a key and then boom, you're in, you're into the system, which is, it should be that easy, right? Got it. And so then you're blasting out all your messages to all these relays. Yeah. And because you're sending them out to so many, these relays are all, you can effectively guarantee that you're not going to get shut out of the entire system. Is that right? Exactly. Um, so there is, there, there, there are some um, downsides to this approach. Um, so your friends have to be using the same set of relays or else you won't get their messages. So it's not like a peer to peer mm. network where all these messages are getting broadcast to all the nodes, um, which actually makes it a bit more flexible. Um, so a couple of use cases I was thinking of is imagine if you're running a relay for your own company um, that is just like maybe even firewalled, but it only works within your um, your organization. You can actually be sending messages. Everyone within your company could be sending messages to that relay and then your client connects to that relay, but only your client can see those messages because you're authenticated with that or you're on a VPN that can only see that. Um, and I actually do that. I actually run a private Nostra relay on my WireGuard VPN at home. And so whenever I get paid, um, when my Lightning node receives a payment or my Bitcoin node receives a payment, I actually send a Nostra event to my private relay that my app connects to. So I can actually get these like real-time notifications of, of payments and stuff to Domus, which is, which is completely private to me. So there's a lot of cool like use cases like that. Which, uh, yeah. Now, what's the incentive for someone to run a public relay? Because this, be this would be a pretty large database, right? Like it would take up quite a few, like big resource uh, requirement. Yeah, so I mean, Cause I, so I, my, I'm actually running a relay, like the Domus relay right now. And my goal is that I'm just going to store everything, no matter how spammy it is. So it's probably going to be pretty large scale, but to be honest, these are just small JSON blobs in terms of like data scale nowadays. Like it's not hard to just put that into a database on Amazon somewhere and just store everything. Um, so yeah, it is the, like, but why would I do that as a, as, as a Domus, you know, uh, relay? Um, well, first of all, I want this, I want this to succeed. I think it's a really cool, cool idea. So it's almost like. That's one a good enough reason for me, but there are some relays that if they don't, um, if if if, you're, if if it comes to a point where the spam is so bad, what relays can do is like, hey, if you want to send a message to my relay, you have to pay this lightning invoice maybe once a month. Um, so Fiat Jaff actually has an example of this. Um, it's called the expensive dash relay dot Fiat Jaff, I think, and then you can it'll give you a lightning invoice and you give it a pub key and you pay that, and then now you have permission to send to that relay. So you can actually st make, um, and then if you're, if you're spam conscious, maybe you only want to connect to those relays that are paid for. Um, so that, that's one example of, um, so yeah, so, so spam is an issue on the network and there are a bunch of different approaches that we're, that we're looking at right now, which is like proof of work, which I'm not sure if it'll work. Um, these paid relay options. Um, I have a few ideas on how to even just um, have these like an orange check idea. So Michael Saylor had this idea on, on Twitter Whereas you buy an orange check and then even if there are people who are buying orange checks and spamming you, you can eventually block them over time. Um, so maybe, um, you know, you pay Domus, the Domus relay, and they'll give you an orange check, which is again, just a, a Nostra message. And then clients can download those orange checks and then use that for spam protection. So that's another way of monetizing, which I'm, I'm looking at, but yeah, there's a lot of different approaches. Right now, uh, uh, let's talk about this in the context of Twitter. Do you think this is, the, is this the system 
that we've all been looking for. When we talk, like in the last decade, people have been talking about, and, and mostly in the last couple of years, um, once once people started getting banned on Twitter, is like, we need an alternative. We need something where we can't get banned. We, we can be free to express our thoughts with whoever we want. Um, is this the solution that can scale to the level of, of you know Twitter adoption today? Yeah, I don't know if you like notice like the things I work on are like in some sense extremely idealistic. Like I, you know, you know, on the Bitcoin node side, I'm like I'm expecting everyone to run a node because that's the right way to use Bitcoin. I wouldn't be working on Nostra if I didn't think it was the answer. It's the simplest possible way to implement this thing that we want, right? Um, it's been plagued in the past by there hasn't really been many good client implement, implement, implementations. And uh, Damas is my attempt to like let's see how good we can make um, a Twitter replacement app. And I and I think like you know. I'm using it day to day and it's faster than Twitter. Like it's, I mean, we don't have like the scale of Twitter yet, but um, mm -hmm. I think it's better than Twitter like already. <laughs> That's like, maybe I'm biased, but, um, but yeah, I think it's the answer. I think it's the simplest possible thing that could work. And I think it's a great protocol and I think more people should try it because it's, uh, it's the answer. I don't, I don't see any better protocol, so. Yeah, I, I was testing it out last night. So I, I used, for people who, who haven't heard of it, uh, Damus, it's damus.io, right? Yeah. D-A-M-U-S. There's a link at the bottom. And yeah. Yeah, there's a test flight lake, um, and this is a client of Nostr. And so you can kind of like, you, you can send messages, I guess, across Nostr yeah. using this client, right? Yeah, and you don't even need to use, like, it's funny because I was building this app and I had test users because people were using other clients. So there's one called um, astral.ninja, which I think is the most popular web um, client. Um, but yeah, there's not many. I think someone's, a few people are working on like uh, desktop ones, but... Yeah, but it was cool. That I was able to like test with actual other users writing their own clients. Um, um, so yeah, it's there's a wider network and there's a lot of relays that people are running. And uh, Domus just is one interface to it. I think it's the best interface, but so I'm probably biased. But it is to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So so anyone using Domus is connected to the same set of relays. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, not necessarily. So some users might only be sending to their private community and i have no idea i have no insight on those messages um but there are only a few i think there's like a website it's called like uh, nostra relay registry and it there's probably like 10 relays that are up right now and i pretty much just connect all of them so i see the whole network but yeah. uh and but you're also assuming that other people are connected to those relays as well but you might so they people might not be getting your messages and people but there's a way around this on on the protocol you can actually send out um, you can actually look at all the relays that people are connected to and just connect to the whole, anyway, so there's, there's other ways to get around it, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's kind of like a global network at, the, at this time. Mm -hmm. So now Nostra itself is not, it's not built on lightning. It's not built on Bitcoin. It's its own protocol, yeah. but you are with, with Domus integrating lightning payments into it. Yeah. Can you talk to me more about how that works and why you chose to, to integrate lightning payments? Um, yeah, I mean, so. I haven't done it yet, but it's kind of like just an idea. Um, I think it'd be really cool just to be able to like, instead of sending likes, which are kind of vain and don't really mean much, maybe just, you know, send people 50 sats. Um, I really like the stacker yeah. news model where, you know, you can just put in a few, a couple of thousand Satoshis in your account and then you can just, it's really easy to tip, right? So I'm probably going to do something like that with Indomus. Um, now how that actually works and, ha and how it um, interacts with the global Nostra network i i do want to make it a decentralized a decentralized protocol like so we have these um uh these improvement proposals i think they're called like nostra implementation possibilities um so they're like a play on word on uh the the, the bips from bitcoin but they're called nips in nostra um uh so people can propose any change so i i i have a few where you know i'm adding likes to the network i'm adding uh, retweets to the network because those don't currently exist but there's no reason why you couldn't have one that says this is a lightning tip message. Um, so, and then, so if you have some verif verifiable way that a lightning node was as, a, as like a, a receipt, maybe, maybe a lightning node itself would send out a Nostra message when it was paid. And then, um, then you can, you can tally those receipts in, in the client and just like sum it up and, and show a tip number, um, which I think would be, I think it's really important to have that, like the tip number to see how many t tips it received. I think Twitter right now, mm -hmm. they just have a, a lightning invoice and you pay it and it's like you, it sends them a private message and that's cool too. Maybe I'll support that. But I really like the Stacker News model where you can actually see a, a sum total. So doing that on over Nostra would be really interesting because then other clients could, if they wanted to, they could 
pull down those those t tip receipts and and also display them on their client. So, um, trying to avoid all yeah. having anything platform specific or DOMA specific. I just you know these are just messages that are getting sent to the relay, so other people can use those to to, to as well. So. What do you think the interesting implications are of having tips or boosts or whatever we want to call them integrated into social apps? Like we we we've seen Twitter has a tip jar, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, Stacker News, you mentioned, yeah. um, Fountain, we're going to be doing this, this podcast is going to be streamed anyone listening to this podcast on Fountain or Breeze or any of the other podcast and 2.0 apps can send in sats. It's going to get split automatically between you and I That's really cool. and one of the listeners who sent in a question. Um, what, what do you think the big implications are of sats being slinging around the internet, you know, <laughs> at, at the speed of light? What, what changes about the world? with this in the hands of everyone yeah i just it's one of those things where you know this you could be in the middle of your village in like somewhere in africa and you could just be really funny and just post interesting content and you can actually make money and and, and actually support your family or support like i that's mind-blowing to me that you know people who are unbanked somewhere can actually do that and then we're all talking the same open source protocol and the same network so it's I think it's very powerful. I don't even know what the implications are because it's just, it's hard to imagine what that could unlock. Uh, but I'm really excited for it. And uh, yeah, I just, maybe we can just move away from this like vain, vanity culture of just likes and actually maybe provide value for your fellow citizens through tip. And, and, and that's like a signal to like do more of that content and, and instead of just getting yeah. like likes and retweets, which don't really mean anything. I don't know. Yeah, I mean like a like and a retweet, it, it is a signal, but it's a very muddy signal. Yeah. It's not very clear. Like, it, it doesn't give you direct value. Yeah. It, it may amplify your message a little bit. It may, you know, generate a couple extra followers. But yeah, you start receiving money, and that's a very, very direct signal that you did a good job. I really appreciated this. Yeah. I'm giving you some of my, you know, if we think of Bitcoin as this like battery or like, you know, this is your like financial uh, battery, mm -hmm. then you know, I'm giving some of my energy to you, yeah. right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, that, it's, I wonder if it's, it's almost like more of an impact when I, when I receive sats, cause I like, wow, this guy really went out of his way like to do that. And I'm like, I don't know if it, it feels more yeah, important, more rewarding than just receiving likes. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. I wonder if this just, this totally like changes the quality level of content on the internet and it, get, it raises the bar where, where all of a sudden you have like people earning full-time incomes on you know a decentralized twitter or a decentralized reddit uh you know and it's just kind of like people take it more seriously and are more like committed to getting great content out there yeah and it's it's more about like it puts a lot more power into the the content creators and uh versus just like these platforms where the their main source of money is just to get as many eyes onto the platform and then they basically sell ads and it's just like this very like corp like inhumane i feel like the web has really gone downhill it's gotten more more corporate and less less fun less like human like i feel like it really if you, we have peer-to-peer -peer sat slinging it's like that's way cooler it's like it's way more human to me versus just like this corporate web that we have today which is just depressing it's getting and it's just getting like i don't know it's it's not good but hopefully yeah maybe the maybe bitcoin fixes everything maybe it'll fix uh the web so we'll see <laughs> yeah yeah the, i was having a conversation with michael Le levine at uh lightning labs um in i think episode 48 of the show and he was talking about how like on google and facebook twitter they have like a direct incentive to make the product worse over time hmm. like like not just that it's it's gonna be you're always gonna see ads it's like you're gonna have to see more and more ads and and that's been the case for the last decade is like Every single year, YouTube is, you know, ramping up the number of ads, the amount of ads you see, the the time limits, the, you know, now all of a sudden you're getting 15 second ads. It used to be like a six second ad. Yeah. yeah. And it just keeps going higher. And it, that's the only way for that business model to win is either get more users. But once you've maxed out your users or you've fully penetrated all Internet users, you have to up the ads give them more ads yeah. i because I, I joined I, I remember i think my my twitter account is like 2007 or something i joined I'm, i don't remember there being this many ads like nowadays like every 
two or three tweets, I just have to like block and add. It's like, it feels like it's an impossible task. I'm just yeah. like, add, add, add. It's like, it's just depressing. I'm like, I don't, I just don't even want to use it anymore. I mean, I'm still addicted. I'm like, Twitter is my, obviously my favorite app, but uh, it's just, yeah, it's just, this is the issue when you have these platforms that control everything is that you have no control. It's like, we're just serfs under their, you know, they, they control everything and we don't have any say and they can ban us and it's just not, mm -hmm. it's not good. We don't, we, we got to move to something better, I think. Now, is there a, is there a business model for Nostra or Domus? And how do you think about that? Because, yeah. um, yeah, I want to know, is this, is this going to turn into a business? Um, I've been thinking about it. Like, I really like the use cases of, you know, making the workflows for organizations more interesting. So maybe if you're a, you're a, an organization and you want to have your own private social network, that might be one source of revenue. Um, I, I do want to make it to a business because I, cause I want to work on it more. Like if I'm getting paid to do it, it means people care and that I can make it better. Cause right now it's kind of just, I'm working on it in my spare time. I, I have a full-time job. So if it, if it did take off, get popular, I would, I would love to work on a full-time, hire people, you know, build out the Android apps, but to monetize it. Yeah. There's like many different approaches, like maybe this or organization approach. Um, I think, I think spam on the network is going to be an issue. Like I think we can solve the spam problem, um, just with like this orange tech idea. So if, if Dam if Damas is minting orange checks, then that's one source of revenue. And it's just it's trivial for like you pay me and I'll give you an orange check, and then you and then the clients can use that for spam prevention. So like that's the one thing I was thinking about. Uh, but anyone can issue orange checks, right? I'm just like my particular app cares about <laughs> Damas orange checks. Like that's one situation where, um, yeah, you could use that. But other clients could also use those orange checks because they're just signed messages from my node. Uh, I don't know. So there's there's a bunch of different approaches. That, uh, so I, I don't think that's going to be an issue. But maybe one day. <laughs> Maybe one day make it what money. do you think about the Stacker News model of uh, it, it costs one sat to post or comment on Stacker News? Is that something that you you think is is appropriate for a decentralized Twitter? No, because I don't want to. I don't ever want to gatekeep. Um, I don't want to like you need to use Lightning to use the app because I think the free speech aspect of it is more important. Um, I, I'm seeing messages coming out of China, cause I which is like, and 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 I'm seeing like what's happening on the ground there i'm like wait a minute i don't ever see that on twitter i'm like why don't i see maybe i don't follow the right people <laughs> but um since i just see everything on the network i'm seeing stuff from these different areas of the world that i n normally wouldn't see so i'm like wait a minute they're using nostra because twitter's probably banned um like they can't get on tour in china you can't even get on tour um so right now nostra is a way to like they can just they could bounce it off a satellite they could send a nostra message somewhere and as long as it gets onto a relay or multiple relays that would be a really powerful censorship resistant way of communicating um, so I was like, I really want to make sure the free speech aspect of this app is like number one importance. And I don't want to gatekeep it to like, um, so you need to pay a, a sat or something, but th there's no reason why another client couldn't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was, this was an incredible discussion. I, I learned a ton. Um, I want to say, I want to move over into a segment that I call the lightning round okay. where listeners can send in questions and uh, get a chance to to be added to the show splits for this episode, so potentially earn some sats. Cool. Um, are you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. Welcome to the lightning round presented by Zebedee, your portal into the world of Bitcoin gaming. The Zebedee app offers a full-featured lightning wallet seamlessly integrated with your own personal gamer tag so that you can earn Bitcoin on all of Zebedee's games on mobile and desktop. It's never been more fun to earn Bitcoin and Zebedee is your key to it all. To claim your personal gamer tag and start earning some Bitcoin of your own, download the Zebedee app today. Uh, so we had one listener question uh, come in and then I have a few questions for you as well. Okay. First listener question comes in from BTC McBoatface and says, okay. in the context of Bitcoin and Lightning development, what advantages or disadvantages have arisen from living in Canada? Uh, so, so the question is um, the advantages of, sorry, so what was the question? <laughs> of living in Canada, you know, in the context of Bitcoin and Lightning development. Oh yeah, maybe it's really motivated me to like uh, work on it more because people's bank accounts and stuff are getting closed up here and our government is just out of control. So it's like, I, I like it's incentivized me to like want to work on Bitcoin more just because just how tyrannical our government is and it's like shutting down people's bank accounts. Like you shouldn't be able to just do that just because they have a different political opinion. Like, I don't know. So that was been helpful. You know, this like 
I want to take down the man because <laughs> um, so that's been really motivating. If I was in a country where, you know, I had access to like uh, financial services, I mean, I still like Bitcoin, but, you know, it's le definitely less incentive. But when you're in these countries where, you know, we're being subjugated like this, it's uh, yeah, it gives me a lot of incentive to work on Bitcoin. Fair enough. Uh, I'm also in Canada, just uh, on the other side of the country. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> um, so, okay, another question for you. How many people will be running Lightning nodes in the year 2030? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a really good question. It would be interesting to see the, the, growth, uh, the growth charts. I haven't looked at them recently um, and see if that pattern continues. I think for active nodes right now is about 20,000, maybe a little under 20,000 active nodes. Okay. Um, but, you know, stretch out like another eight years or so. Mm. What, what do you think? I think I'm, how big, how big does this get? I think a million nodes would be nice. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't, yeah. someone asked me this before at the, at, the, at the meetup I went to recently, like, you know, is more nodes better? It's like, I, I guess, but I don't know. Like I, I haven't thought about what it would, how it would behave at larger scales and all these things. Um, obviously more people using lightning is better, but well, I don't know. So it's, it's, there's a lot of, it, I, you just kind of have to see what's going to happen. I, I have no idea. It's, hmm. Is there a downside to more people at, at a certain point? Like, like what would be a downside if, um, yeah, like, you know, I haven't done, I'm sure like Renee or someone have done this, this modeling much better than me, but you know, in a bigger network, um, maybe I wouldn't be as well connected. So maybe I'd be more inclined to have maybe to keep opening more channels to more diverse nodes to so like to become more connected to the network over time so that might be concerned it was like it was trivial when the nodes when there was 20 nodes on network because like it just we all just opened a channel to each other and it all worked but yeah it's it, you know in terms of your connectivity to the whole network it's i think there might be some type of third degree of separation math that maybe it's not a big deal but um hmm. yeah i have i'd have to look at the math and how that works in terms of yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if you could change one thing about Bitcoin, what would you change? If I can't change one thing about Bitcoin, oh, that's a good question. Um, it's it's perfect though. Why do you want to change it? Like, <laughs> it's like <laughs> I'm not suggesting we do change it. Uh, I'm just saying if, it, if if you had the power to change one thing, I think if I and this doesn't have to be about Bitcoin's code either. It can oh, be about the community. It can be about oh, the, okay. yeah, anything. Bitcoin in general. Uh, yeah, I wish more people like took it really seriously to, to run nodes and, and, and identify like that's really important. Um, obviously it's, it's more of a, a technical issue. We need to make it easier for people to run nodes. Um, I definitely want to live in a future where everyone's running nodes and we all interact with each other peer to peer. I, I don't feel like we're, I, I'm worried that we're not going in that direction. Um, I feel like we're relying too much on the web and things like that. So yeah, if there's one thing I could change, maybe if we could convince more people to run nodes and do that. What do you think the biggest adoption hurdle is for people when, when, you know, presented with the idea of running a node? Like why, are, what's the objection people have today? It's just too complicated, right? It's like, um, it should be, it should be easier. Um, and there's too many issues. Like if you're, if you're like a lot of the time it's suggested that you use a raspberry Pi and these raspberry Pis have these SD cards that fail and it's just, you know, you don't want to be running a business and you just say, oh, someone told me to get this Raspberry Pi and I plug it in and it stops working, right? So we need to make sure reliability is like super solid. We need to make it easier to run nodes. Um, so, yeah. Is cost an issue too for running a Raspberry Pi, do you think? Uh, I don't think so. It's just, they're pretty cheap, right? You can get them for like 50 bucks or something. Um, and software's free. So it's more about the, the maintenance uh, admi admin Right. You don't if you, have, if you have if you're hiring, if you have people on your team, if you're running a restaurant, you're not you don't have like a technical person to who do you call to maintain that device? Um, there's all kind of like issues of maintenance. So reducing the maintenance burden is really important, I think. Yeah. OK, final question. Um, are there any books that have meaningfully changed your view of the world? <sighs> um, yeah, I don't. It's a good question. There's, I've, I've definitely read a lot of books. Putting you on the spot. I know. I'm just trying to think of all the. I mean, obviously the Bitcoin standards. Like, that was the one. Like I, I think I just. That's like the fastest book I ever read. It was just like, changed the way I think about. Because I'm not. I wasn't originally super thinking about money. The I just. I'm. I'm the nerd. I like to play with the technology. I'm like this is kind of a cool toy. But then once I started learning yeah. more and more about like, you know, 
the low time preference, things like that, and the importance of like sound money. I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty important for society. And uh, what I was treating like a toy, I, maybe I should t treat it with a bit more respect. And that really changed. Uh, that's in some sense, that's what made me focus on Bitcoin full time t transition from the from just a cool internet toy to like this could actually change people's lives and this can make the the future a better place. It was after probably reading that book. Interesting. All right. That's all for the lightning round. Um, I want to make sure we finish off with uh, where people can go to learn more about you and the work you're doing. Yeah, so you could follow me on uh, on, on Nostra. <laughs> if you go to, but uh, no, I'm I'm actually most active on Twitter just because most people aren't on Nostra right now. So my Twitter is JB55. I just I literally just post everything I'm doing all the time. So if you're crazy and you want to follow my stream of consciousness, you can do that on my Twitter. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find me. Nice. And then for, for downloading Damus, it's Damus.io. Yeah, D-A-M-U-S dot I-O. And there's a link at the bottom. Um, pushing out a new version probably today. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm i going to keep building it. I think there's a lot of features I still want to add, like encrypted DMs. I want to add like signal level encryption to the to the DMs because we deserve that. We should, Signal shouldn't be tied to one phone. Anyway, don't get me started on signal. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's. Uh, I'm just, I want to make this the best possible decentralized social media app with, with secure communication. So. Love to hear it. And thank you for taking the time today. Hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me. All right. In the last seven days, you guys sent in 10,104 sats. We had a few different supporters and a lot of activity on Fountain. They launched their Listen to Earn feature. I got a lot of new Fountain followers. Uh, and it seems like there's a lot of activity happening on the app right now. Uh, it's very cool to see. If you are not listening on Fountain, you should be. You can earn sats simply for listening to a podcast. Um, I hope this is going to bring on more podcasters as well. So if you're a podcaster and you're not set up on Fountain, definitely give that a shot. Let's run through a couple of comments and questions. Uh, Sir Brian of London says, I am responsible for more than half of all value-enabled podcasts. There are video creators on 3Speak TV powered by Hive, and their sats are converted to Hive by my infrastructure. I know there's a lot of creators on 3Speak TV um, that have value blocks. Uh, I think that's interesting, but I, I don't I don't quite understand the value of converting sats into another into Hive. I, I imagine that's another cryptocurrency. I don't I don't get that. I think sats are this like interoperable standard that have product market fit in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And one of the benefits of using sats is that I can take sats from Fountain, I can put them on Stacker News. I can earn on Stacker News. I can send them to another game. I can send them to another platform. I can I can do crowdfunding. I can do all these things with Sats. Everyone's on the same standard. I think Sats are the standard here. Uh, so I don't I don't understand the uh, conversion to other cryptocurrencies. But uh, glad to see more podcasters are are getting on Lightning. Um, we got a comment from Spiral, which came in a little bit after I filmed with William Kasserin uh, and Spiral says, does sending Bitcoin through Lightning remove UTXO history from BTC, AKA remove KYC? Now, I am no privacy expert here. Um, this may actually be a question I should send over to, to William to get a more informed view. Um, my understanding though with Lightning is that it is privacy first, but it is not impenetrable. There are people that have been probing the network, trying to figure out where balances are on certain channels and on certain nodes. I don't know that it is a it is a silver bullet solution. You know, like you can mix coins and all of a sudden, you know, your your transaction history is gone. I I don't know that that is true. Um, I think it is more private than than the base Bitcoin blockchain, of course, but um, I don't know that it is impenetrable. Um, Muhammad says, I like this discussion. Thanks in response to episode 23 with Adam Curry and Mary Oscar sent a test comment, uh, to the Kevin Rook show. Um, so thank you everyone to, for sending in sats and comments and questions. Let me know what you think of this episode and keep an eye out on my Twitter for an announcement of the next guest coming up in a few days. See you then.